I, I think it's probably obvious that the fibre thing, Greg, I think a lot of people haven't understood this yet. Trackside only want to go where there's fibre installed to make the screening of pitches and broadcasting of pitches, which is crucial for turnover, as cheap as possible. So these aren't the dates for ever in a day heading forward. But Peter, on that subject, in the future, if tracks are not fibre enabled and therefore cheaper for trackside to broadcast pitches out of, are their futures doubtful now because of that reason? Or is that something which may be put on hold for six months or a year? Because some of our smaller tracks aren't going to have that either. They're not. No, look, I think it certainly comes into the picture for the thinking for this season, perhaps slightly less so for, for next season. But cost is going to be an ongoing consideration, whether it's related to uh, the cost of running a venue from a venue services charges perspective from Rita or any other costs associated um, in terms of transporting horses uh, to the races, the cost associated with running Rita, with running Harness Race New Zealand, with running clubs. All of those things are going to have to be under the microscope in the new environment. So, Peter, is, is this going to fast forward? the closing of some tracks because there, there are some tracks which are never going to have this and therefore that's going to be a major cost and for example Westport I think it should stay open but it's an awfully long way from any other race tracks and it takes a lot of horses and people to move to a spot to get it there there's no horse population to support a local meeting same for example could be said about Har River or some of those regions are we going to see some tracks close or tracks we're not going to have harness racing at again in the future because of these cost cuts, fibre being one of them, transportation of people and horses being another? Well, I think uh, rather than looking at, at, at COVID, we should go back to the fact that there's been considerable amount of work done on future venue plans by all codes. And you would have seen the work that Thoroughbreds have done um, in bringing back the number of tracks that they race at. And we've started to, to run through the same process. So certainly that needs to be in our thinking for next year. Um, the, if you look at uh, Westboys as, as an example, one of the key things we need to consider actually, so what cost is one thing, but so is revenue. And the results at, at Westport from a wagering perspective are very strong. Um, and certainly also it gives participants the opportunity uh, to have a different environment and for us to expose ourselves to a, a public that generally don't go to the races. So all of those things need to be in our thinking. There's no one determinant of what will make a venue potentially in the mix or not, but there's a lot, certainly a hell of a lot to think about. Mate. There's no question about that. Some of the questions that came through can be put into a category, Peter, around stakes. That was the main focus. I would say 30% of the questions were what are the, the stake levels going to be in the short and longer term? So can you tell us today, certainly for the remainder of season 1920, where our minimum stake level will be at? I can. Um, actually, and look, by the time this interview goes to air, I, I hope that we've been able to have confirmation of that via Rita and uh, also via the board. Um, so I guess there's been a lot of speculation, as you say, and, and it's important that we understand that what we're talking about now is only for the resumption of racing. And that largely that, that um, racing period is, is our lower key meeting. So if you take the jewels out, um, which of course we won't be racing this year, then the meetings that we're comparing to uh, uh, industry meetings, if you like, that we run at that time of the year, so the minimum stake will run for during that period is 7,000. Um, certainly that's not quite where we'd like it to be, but actually we've run races at that level this season already. Our minimum uh, acceptable level is 6,000 according to our rules of racing. We won't be racing for 6,000 as long as the stake, uh, sorry, the funding that's available from Rita stands up and that'll be subject of course to wagering performance. But to give you an indication, um, I just compared a couple of meetings last year. So a meeting at, at Rangura with nine races ran for 70,000 in July last year. If we ran it this year, it would run um, at about 65. Uh, meeting at Cambridge with eight races ran for about 70,000. This year it would run for about 60. Um, um, Addington, who um, obviously pay slightly a, a premium of stakes, there'll be a, a, a bigger gap. Um, they tended to run at, a, at around about an average of 10,000 for um, their winter meetings, that's probably going to be in, um, in and around eight and a half um, as an average. Where the key differential will be is, is in Auckland, of course. And the reason for that is that the Auckland Club have done a really good job on topping up stakes in the last few years. And what COVID's done for them has meant that those income streams that they're expecting to see from their retail have been delayed. 
So they won't be in a position to be topping stacks up. So certainly there's going to be a differential for what we're used to racing at, at, um, at the ATC compared to what we will have available in this period. Peter, there's been a lot of talk about RETA and therefore the money that comes on them in setting stakes. But I think a lot of people have got a little bit lost on this. RETA clearly don't set stakes. They bulk fund the industry or the codes and then those stakes levels, are they chosen by HRNZ or clubs? For example, if RETA says there's this much money, and obviously that's their job, is to produce enough money, that's another subject. Once that money comes into you guys, how is it differentiated between, for example, we're going to run minimums of 7,000, but our better race is going to be 12. Is that done by HRNZ? Is that done by the clubs? What's to stop a club saying we'll run the worst horses for 3,000 and the better horses for 18? Are those things in the ballpark, or does HRNZ set those levels? So in a normal course of events, we would work with the clubs and setting the stakes. And in this situation, we are going to prescribe what the stakes are in terms of the minimum. If the club is any position to top up, that's their choice. I would have thought that the way that everybody's been affected by COVID-19, that's unlikely. So I think you'll see a, a prescribed stake structure that will run for just through to that discrete period at the end of July. So when you say structure, minimum, for example, 7,000, let's start there, it might be a little bit higher. Are you going to say a rating 80 plus race has to be a minimum of 10,000 or 11,000? Are there going to be minimum levels per stake structure or rating band? How do these minimums actually work? Because we know what maidens might be. So how do we know what the best race of the night's going to be? Yeah, look, the reality is there's not a huge amount of money in the pot mix. So trying to differentiate, that's not going to be easy. There will be a differential for the better class of horses, but it won't be a significant one. But as it hasn't been, again, if we use the Addington example, um, as it hasn't been really in the winter anyway, to any great extent. Um, so we are um, keen to see some tighter class racing if we can get it established. There's obviously going to be a lot less of it. It'll be, there'll be a lot of um, up to R60 and a lot of maidens racing it, as we would normally expect to see at that time of the year. So um, certainly the club has no opportunity to run for less than whatever we prescribe as the minimum. Um, that won't that won't be happening. Just a question for you, Peter. You've raced horses. There's people watching this who are racing horses and are paying bills, and those bills probably average between two thousand and two and a half thousand dollars a month. What do you say to people who say I can't afford to race a horse anymore, or I'm happy to cop this for six months, but I can't afford to race if this is going to be the future? Because they are legitimate concerns. As the boss, what do you say to harness racing owners with those concerns? Yeah, look, I'm, I'm the same as, as those people in terms of I've got horses and work mixed with and have the, the same challenges. I guess for, for none of us go into owning horses on the basis that we'll think we'll get a financial return. But equally, I understand that you want to be able to mitigate some of those costs on the, on the way through. So the stakes we're talking about, I have to really reinforce, are only through to the end of July. We do not know what they look like. And we, we honestly don't know. We've had no indication from Rita as yet as to what stakes look like for next year. Um, and I just, I'll just remind you, when you, if you're racing for at Rangoora for a total stakes of 65 and it was 70, it's not so very different. Um, it is certainly different in Auckland, and I, and I acknowledge that. The club I know are very keen to see those income streams um, be revived a little later in the year, and then be able to get back into topping up stakes as they, if they've done such a good job on over the last couple of years. To get horses back to the track, why don't we have penalty-free racing, whether it's a month or to the end of the season, and say, we'll reset those races. You get Whatever penalty you get between May 29 and July 31, you have to get up that scale, because otherwise you'd race maidens every week. But why don't we reset that clock on August the 1st, just to give people a reason to go back at lower stakes? Well, if you think about what you've said, uh, what you said is, let's have a, get, get a pull of horse back to the races. We're going to have a pull of horses back to the races. And so the challenge, if you, if you took that view, is that then you potentially have an equity between horses that are there and aren't. Um, we are going to revise the, the uh, rating matrix, and that's been done in conjunction with the Handicapping Working Group. So that will see if you're racing for, for less money, then you'll, you'll get a, uh, less of a penalty. We, did, we have considered it. There's been a number of people suggested penalty-free. A lot of people were asking that if we were racing, for example, for 5,000 or less, would it be penalty-free? The good news is we're not going to be in that situation. Peter, what can you say to the owners and breeders, and breeders in particular, because it's getting pretty close to breeding season, what confidence can you give them that this industry is going to be in a strong position in the next two to five years? 
You know, like that's, that, that's what we're all working towards, of course, isn't it? So that goes to the questions around cost. It goes to the questions around outsourcing. What If we just keep doing the same thing as we've always done, then that won't happen. I can assure you we won't be doing the same things that we've always done. And that so that applies at HR and Z level. It applies at RETA. It has to apply for everybody. We, we need to apply new thinking. If we, you know, the, the aspiration shouldn't be let's get back to where we were six months ago. The aspiration needs to be much more than that.